All right. Well, great. Thank you. It's uh, an honor and a delight. As always, I really appreciate deeply the uh, tremendous work that you folks are doing at the Real Truth About Health Conference. And it's been, uh, I think, one of the uh, a beacon of light in our society because the, uh, in many ways, the, uh, the mainstream media and many of the avenues that we have for getting our information uh, are compromised and corrupted in many ways. So uh, we have to go around and in, <laughs> find our way to, uh, to connect with uh, more authentic and I think more valid uh, information. So this is really uh, an honor, like I say, to be here. I'd like to go ahead and, and jump right in and so the uh, underlying idea in, in, in everything, all the work that uh, I'm doing and that my wife Madeline and I are doing as we travel around the United States and do uh, videos and write books and so forth uh, is based on good news. The basic good news uh, is that all of us as human beings have been given this very precious gift, the gift of a physical body that does not require any animals to suffer to get all the nutrients that we need to thrive and to celebrate our lives on this beautiful and abundant earth. So that's the basic underlying you know, truth. The problem of course is that all of us have been wounded. We've been raised in a society where from the time we're little infants, we've been compelled to participate in mealtime rituals you know, where every day, three times a day, typically breakfast, lunch, and dinner, we're participating in eating the flesh and secretions of animals who've been uh, severely abused their entire lives, typically. And their foods, the so-called foods that we're eating, the flesh of these animals and dairy products and eggs, uh, carry a lot of toxins. And these toxins uh, operate on many levels. Uh, and so I think a lot of what I'm trying to do here is to broaden our conception of health, deepen our understanding of our society and generate a spiritual perspective uh, on our life and how we can heal our relationship with each other, with animals, with the earth, uh, and with the deeper dimensions of being actually that we've disconnected from. So that's the basic idea. And I, I think, uh, it might be nice just to uh, start out briefly uh, with a short meditation. So I'd like to just invite people as you're listening, just maybe take a moment uh, and join together. I happen to be sitting here in the living room of our home in Northern California, and I'm at the piano. So um, I think it would, this might be coming through, hopefully. Uh, let's just take a moment and give thanks for this precious opportunity of a human life, for this opportunity to grow in wisdom and compassion, to awaken to the truth that we are. We give thanks for this beautiful earth. We give thanks for the abundance and the beauty that are all around us and the animals celebrating their lives here. And we give thanks knowing that every day we connect more deeply with the inner wisdom and clarity and inspiration that are our true nature with the compassion and kindness, with the joy and freedom and creativity, and with a deep sense of appreciation that we have always in every cell of our being for this precious opportunity of a human life. May all beings be happy and free and may we continue together to build a more enlightened society, a world that cares for everyone, a world that reflects the truth 
of the infinite interconnectedness of life. And we give thanks knowing that we are part of the awakening of human consciousness on this earth. To live our lives as we are intended to here in harmony, in joy, in freedom, in abundance, in the truth. And so it is. <clears throat> so, to me, this is uh, an essential aspect of our uh, life is taking time to connect with inner silence and with the underlying sense of gratitude that uh, really, I think, permeates uh, the whole universe. It permeates our own being. And when we, when we see that, when we see that the natural response uh, to love and to being loved is a sense of gratitude and that we're loved all the time by the sun and the moon and the wind and the rain and the stars and the earth. And uh, I think we get disconnected from this basic sense of being loved through the deep structure of our uh, society and through animal agriculture. And so the whole idea here really is Again, not to blame anyone or, or criticize anyone necessarily at all. And this, this is, it's a wounding that's happened. And in the World Peace Diet, I, I take the journey, essentially, of understanding of how this all happened and why it's, why it's happened. And trace it back 10,000 years ago to what is today Iraq and uh, this ancient uh, cultures in the, in the Levant area and the Eastern Mediterranean and how for the very first time people, for some reason, scientists aren't really sure why anthropologists don't know if it was because of environmental uh, crises that were happening. But for some reason, uh, people for, started owning animals for food, owning animals as property for food. We call it herding. So there were never, it was never herding, as far as anybody can tell before about 10,000 years ago. People did hunt animals, um, but the idea of owning them as property, that, that, that takes it to a whole nother level. That's basically enslaving them, uh, imprisoning them, seeing them merely as objects, commodities that are bought and sold, reducing them to mere matter. So that was, I believe, the, the, great, the last revolution that our society ever experienced and the great wound that lives still uh, at the core of our culture because that, that transformation, that revolution changed everything. It changed our relationship with animals, of course. It changed our relationship uh, with each other. It changed the relationship between men and women, uh, between power, uh, people with power. And the people with power basically were those who had livestock. So, I go into this in the, in the World Peace Diet more in depth, but I think it's important to understand that this is the invisible reality. It's so, it's so pervasive in what it does to every institution. Uh, it's the Trojan horse, really. I used to teach college courses in, uh, in world religion and also in uh, mythology, world mythology. And one of the, uh, of course, defining mythic stories of Western culture is the Iliad and the Odyssey, which are really about the Trojan War. And this war uh, of the Greeks against the Trojans uh, was essentially finally won by the Greeks through the, the, the idea that uh, Odysseus had to, to give the people of Troy uh, a gift, the gift of a horse that was very beautiful. And they, they just couldn't get into the gates of Troy. And so they couldn't, they were stymied. But with this gift of this beautiful horse, which they hid inside, they were able to completely destroy and burn and kill uh, the, the city and everyone in it. And so I think it's important to understand this metaphor of a Trojan horse because it really lives. It's, it's something that appears like our friend, but actually it's out to destroy us. And there's many aspects of our society right now 
that are Trojan horses. The main one, I think, is animal agriculture. Animal agriculture is, I remember as a kid growing up, being taught that it, meat is where we get our protein and dairy is where we get our calcium and it's how the West was won. It's what made our country great and so forth. And it, this whole animal agriculture, like, like God gives us certain animals to eat and they don't have a soul like we do and they're just put here for us as food and they don't have any other purpose. And so this whole narrative uh, gets its claws into us at a very uh, early age from infancy. I would say even perhaps before infancy, while we're still in our mother's womb, we're, we're, getting, we're getting this on a deep level. And so for anyone to question this, it's very difficult. Uh, it's got 10,000 years of momentum. And we've been trying, I know Madeline and I have been trying, and I know we're just part of a movement that's been making this effort to bring the awareness of compassion for animals and the many benefits of moving to a plant-based way of eating and living. And yet the, resi the resistance is enormous because of this 10,000 years of momentum and the religion and the education and the governmental and economic and familial institutions in our society are all set up basically to reinforce and to encourage and validate animal agriculture and to minimize and distract us from the devastating impacts to our health. So when we understand this deeper structure, it makes, I think, the whole thing much more uh, understandable. And we become, I think, more skillful in how we respond to things and how we speak to people. And I think we become more effective in our advocacy, which I think is important. So uh, this is the basic uh, thing, I guess, to just see at the core of our time here is to understand the wounding and then to see that we as individuals have the power to heal these wounds. That's the thing, to let go of any residue of having a victim consciousness. We're not victims. We are creators and we can create uh, healing for ourselves and our body and our mind and in our society. We can be agents of healing. We can be agents of awakening. So it's this idea of, of letting go of the idea that we're a victim and letting go of the idea ultimately that what that our true nature has ever been harmed. Uh, this is the great good news, I think. <clears throat> so I'll go into these ideas a little bit more. And of course, we'll have time for questions um, a little bit later. So the idea is that 10,000 years ago, when people started to own animals as property for food and herding them, and this was the last great revolution that we've ever had in our society, all the other revolutions have just reinforced and made it easier for us to eat more animals faster than ever. <laughs> we never changed uh, out of that. Uh, but now I think the vegan revolution or the revolution of ahimsa, uh, uh, which is the Sanskrit word that means nonviolence, this is an ancient wisdom teaching. Uh, we've understood it for thousands of years, really, that if we're serious about being healthy and, and creating a, a world of harmony and abundance and so forth, then it's not going to ever work if we're going to eat animal foods. This has been understood by sages, by uh, a number of different uh, saints and wisdom uh, holders from many traditions. And this teaching has been continuous, but the teaching has been suppressed, especially in the Western society. It's been suppressed pretty brutally. And it's, it comes up and, it, and it's, it's, a, it's an ancient wisdom. It's the perennial wisdom that keeps coming back and it keeps getting repressed. But when we started this uh, herding animals 10,000 years ago, this was long before we ever wrote any books. The uh, historic period only emerged about 3,000 3, years ago, maybe 3,500 years ago. We had the oldest books, but already the the herding of animals had been going for six or 7,000 years. So it had deep roots before the first writings ever appeared. And so animals uh, by, that, by that time are seen as property, cows and sheep and goats, and then other animals, pigs and, and, and chickens and so forth. And they're uh, used as wealth. So the whole animal, the whole connection with animals and nature 
changed with herding. It became one of human superiority and domination and exploitation and oppression for our own use of, the, of animals and of the earth itself. And this radical reorientation, uh, it's, it lives in our society at a very deep level and in all of us. And so a lot of the healing, I think, is basically to reconnect with the earth and reconnect with our way of, of being in harmony with the earth and with nature and with animals. So anything we can do to question these narratives is really important. Instead of seeing animals merely as one of two things, either as property, like we own them, we own our dogs, we own our cats, we own our horses, now those are sort of companion animals, but then we also own the animals that we are eating. And so it's important to understand that um, animals are, are either property or they're pests, typically. I mean, they're, you've got, we have huge industries that uh, basically just try to get rid of pests of all kinds, insects, of course, but now, many other animals are can, we try to get rid of. They might interfere. And so this, this, um, this adversarial relationship with nature and with animals, it's, we're no longer in the garden, uh, part of the garden. We're outside the garden now. And that's what animal agriculture did. Basically, it threw us out of the garden. And we, we have been wandering in many ways, isolated and alienated from the earth because animals do not want to have their purposes stolen. They, don't, they do not want to be killed or be impregnated against their will or have their babies stolen. And so these are very hideous actions that we engage in on a regular basis, millions of times every day, not just, I mean, just on a massive scale. Uh, but it started 10,000 years ago this disconnection, this, this and then that led to the arising of a wealthy elite class, which took control of the narrative and took control of the religious and governmental structures. And that's been going on for 10,000 years. A wealthy elite has been controlling uh, government, religion, economics, education, and, and the media, basically the, the, um, the narratives. And so this is the struggle that's been going on since we started animal agriculture and began to stratify uh, our society. The wealthy elite class were those who owned capital. As we know, if you've read the World Peace Diet, the word capita is the old Latin word that means head, uh, as in head of sheep and goats, the old Latin word pecuniary, uh, which means having to do with money. Um, that, has, that, mean, that comes from the Latin word um, pecos, uh, which means cow. So cows were money. Uh, the wealth was livestock. The more livestock you had, the wealthier you were. And, and livestock was more important in the ancient world than gold or silver or anything else. Livestock was wealth. And so that led to wars. There had never been war. And we, and we know, I mean, with this whole thing going on, we've had wars in Syria, Yemen, uh, Libya, Ukraine, all these, you know, in just in the last few years, these ongoing conflicts. And war has been with us uh, since the, since the uh, ancient times. It was originally, the oldest word for war was gavya, which means in Sanskrit, the desire for more cows. So it's this, this yearning to go and get more wealth, the yearning by the wealthy elite to become wealthier, to get more cows, more sheep, more livestock, more capital, more head. And then, of course, you need more land, you need more water. So this uh, I used to teach college courses in the, um, the Iliad and the Odyssey, but also in the Plato and um, in the Republic. You know, Socrates says very clearly two, over 2,000 years ago that uh, if we want to eat meat, we'll have to go to war, right? They knew that back then, that they, we would have to have more land for our cows and sheep and go to war. So this has been well understood really for a long time, but we seem to have forgotten that that the roots of war are really in eating animal foods and animal agriculture. And then slavery, the roots of slavery are in animal agriculture and war because whoever lost the war, not only did the animals become the property of the victors, but the people also. And um, this whole idea of owning other beings led rise, gave rise to human slavery. And this is the key point uh, to understand. And this is something that's sobering. It's uh, very sobering to realize it's true that basically everything we've done to animals that we've dominated and exploited over the years 
we've eventually also done to other human beings. We've, we've pretty much, you know, when you own them as property and then pretty soon we're owning human beings as property. And we had slavery uh, in a gross form for thousands of years, but we still have slavery today. I don't think it's um, right to think that slavery is over. And, and some people uh, who are experts in human trafficking and human slavery today say there's more human slavery uh, today than ever in the history of the world. And of course, there's more slavery of animals than ever in the history of the world. So these are these are living realities. These are not just abstract concepts here. I'm talking about these are powerful forces, the most powerful forces in our world today. Animal agriculture, the owning of other living beings, and then the routine abuse of those beings by the millions, the hyper confinement of those beings and the impregnation of them against their will, the stealing of their babies and the killing of their babies, and then uh, the killing of them. So it's the domination, not only of animals, but specifically of female animals. It's very important to understand that from the very beginning, animal agriculture has been about the domination mainly of female animals and uh, sexual abuse of those female animals. And so, uh, we see, uh, unfortunately, with these first books that emerged, uh, the, the uh, viewing of, of uh, the female merely as a breeder, the woman as a breeder. Cows and other animals are seen merely as breeders, the females. And so this also the reduction in the status of women uh, and of the sacred feminine dimension of life. And so... Uh, women were bought and sold like chattel property uh, in the ancient world because of this domination. And boys were also wounded and forced in many ways to live in a society where the role model for, for males was the hard, tough, disconnected male capable of violence towards animals, towards rival herders, towards women. And this uh, patriarchal, violent, warlike society that emerged in the Eastern Mediterranean has spread. It spread to the Northern Mediterranean regions, as we know, the Greek and the Roman empires spread into Central Asia, into up into Europe, of course, eventually from Europe spread all around the word, world globally. And we're born into that today. It's still alive. It's, it's taken over the entire planet. It's moved into the Amazon uh, indigenous cultures are being destroyed by ranchers right now as we speak uh, in many places uh, in the world. Uh, and so this, uh, this, this spreading uh, globalization of animal agriculture is the greatest wound that's ever happened to the animals of this earth, to the uh, ecosystems of this earth, to the human beings on this earth. It's animal agriculture, this diluted idea of seeing, of looking with a hard, disconnected eye at other living beings and animals and seeing them not as beings, but as things, seeing them as commodities. It's a very perverse, uh, uh, devastating uh, look. I mean, it's the look of the vivisector, someone who works for the pharmaceutical industry, who uh, does experiments on animals, learns to look at mice or rats or monkeys with this cold scientific eye and can just do terrible things to them, cut them up and you know, horribly abuse them without any feelings because animal agriculture and this disconnected mentality that animal agriculture uh, injects into all of us through, in a sense, compelling us to eat meat, dairy, and eggs from the time we're little kids. So that is where the wound gets into us, where the wound gets traction, where we learn to shut down our natural sense of empathy and kindness and connectedness, and we become disconnected and hard in our eyes and in our way of seeing. And that's the great wound that uh, is perpetuated through our society and that causes so much suffering to animals. And of course, the thing to understand is that whatever we sow, we reap. Whatever we put out comes back. And all the world religions have that essential wisdom teaching, and we know that in our bones. So the good news is that there's an essential core within us as human beings of loving kindness and of empathy, 
We don't want to see other beings suffer and be hurt and be harmed. That's the living fabric of our basic wisdom. That's the sacred feminine dimension of consciousness that lives inside all of us. But being raised in a society uh, that went through the hurting revolution and we're now it's a hurting culture right now, we don't think of ourselves as being a hurting culture, but we are. It's covered over. The animals by the millions every day are being killed and it's pretty much hidden away in these stinking sheds where they're raised and hyper confined. You might see a few cows out in the fields, but for the most part, they're in stockyards or they're in sheds. And then they're taken to slaughterhouses, slaughter plants where they're killed. And then you see their flesh and secretions wrapped in plastic and it's all very sanitized and it's all legitimized. And it's given the authoritative stamp of approval by every institution in our society, essentially. And yet all of that is essentially dumbing us down. So this is what happened. Uh, historically, uh, the animal agriculture enterprise uh, created a culture of violence and war that eventually killed off the less warlike cultures of the world. And it's still spreading that, that, um, that original herding culture through uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken and Burger King and McDonald's and through the IMF and the World Bank and through Cargill and Monsanto or Bayer through the big, all these different corporations work together. I call it the military, industrial, meat, medical, pharmaceutical, media, banking complex. And it's a complex that works very well to suck most of the wealth and resources uh, into the hands of a tiny elite. And that's, I think, the reason that it continues is that it continues to work very well for the wealthy elite. But for us, for the people, for future generations, for ecosystems, for animals, it's just not in our best interest. So the greatest gift we can give to our world, to ourselves, to our loved ones, to future generations, to hungry people, to slaughterhouse workers, the whole interconnected web of beings who are harmed by animal agriculture is to question this narrative and then go beyond just questioning the narrative to actually say, all right, I'm not eating any animal foods anymore. I'm not going to wear them. I'm going to do the best I can to minimize the amount of violence I'm causing to animals, to non-human animals. And that will actually minimize the amount of violence we're causing to human animals as well. So there's many... Um, there's many uh, ways that this whole idea spreads out into the world. Uh, there's, there's lots of different tentacles, basically, that animal agriculture has. And it's important to understand them and also to pull our, our, our um, support away from them. So I think moving to an organic, whole food, plant-based way of eating and living is probably the greatest gift we can give to ourselves and our loved ones because that's the foundation for a healthy life. Uh, I, I really think it's important to question some of the so-called plant-based foods that are emerging right now. Um, they're being funded by these large chemical and uh, animal agriculture, excuse me, well, yeah, actually animal agriculture and um, large agricultural um, corporations uh, beyond meat or impossible burgers or lab-grown meat and so forth, uh, a lot of these foods um, and dairy and egg substitutes and so forth, they're very, they're good. I think perhaps if, if it helps to wean people off of meat, dairy, and eggs from animals, but they're really not foods that are healthy and they have a lot of toxins in them. So I think the idea is, I'm going to move the chair here a little bit. <clears throat> the idea here is to realize that plant-based foods, um, if they're coming out of a factory, uh, are, are at best a short-term substitute. Uh, our, our way of living to be healthy uh, is eating whole foods. So eating grains and vegetables and fruits and beans and nuts and seeds as much as possible in their, in their natural state. Uh, and so that is really the foundation for radiant health. And as soon as we eat foods that come from factories, uh, we're eating foods that are going to be processed. And the more processed they are, especially if they have 
genetically engineered ingredients, or if they have uh, residues of pesticide, herbicide, fungicide, and chemical fertilizers, if they're not organic, uh, if they have preservatives and artificial flavors and artificial colors, and these things, these chemicals, uh, our body has to continually work to detoxify itself from these chemicals. So moving to a, a plant-based way of eating, a vegan plant, whole food plant-based way of eating, it's something we can all do. It's, it's an aspiration that we can have and we can learn about it. And I'll, I'll talk about it, uh, ways of doing that that are effective. And of course, it's important to realize also that health is, which is what this whole uh, thing is about, uh, that health is complex. It's not only the food we're eating. Food is a big part of being healthy. Our physical body is in many ways a biochemical organism that is affected very strongly by whatever biochemical uh, products we are eating and what they are and what their constituents are. And as uh, the wonderful researcher T. Colin Campbell emphasizes, we should try to, as much as we can, adopt a holistic perspective and see so, and have some humility and see that foods are enormously complex. And as he says, there's a symphony of, nutri of different nutrients that our bodies are using when we're eating foods. And especially if they're organic, whole plant-based foods, it's a very benevolent symphony. And he says, we will never, ever, ever understand the infinite interconnectedness of all these different nutrients in foods. Uh, this is something that's evolved over millions and millions of years. And there's a tremendous deep wisdom. And so we should avoid the tendency we have in our society to have a reductionist view. That's that, again, it's that scientific eye <laughs> that reduces a being to a thing. It also reduces the living complexity to, to, to uh, something uh, much smaller and, and eas more easily quantifiable. Uh, and uh, I think we have to understand this, that reductionism is, is pervasive in academia. I know, you know, having gotten a PhD myself at Berkeley, um, the tendency is to reduce, to, to reduce the complex into the simple so that we can understand it. But when we, do, when we engage in reductionism, uh, we are doing violence to a reality that is essentially far greater than, than our models can ever be. And uh, we have to understand, as T. Colin Campbell says very clearly, that reductionism is pervasive because it is profitable. Reductionism is profitable. It makes a lot of money for the pharmaceutical medical complex, for governmental complex, for the banking industry, for the food industry, for the, pharma for the um, petroleum industry and the chemical industry. So, uh, and for the media, of course, to make everything simple. So it's important to develop as much as we can a, a nuanced approach to health and to see that there are many, many factors that affect our health. But food is a huge one. So we will be talking about food, but there's a lot more to it. But to, uh, to understand the bigger picture of the history of our society and the fact that we're born into a hurting society that's based on the domination of the sacred feminine so that our own inner feminine capacities, whether we're a man or a woman, have also been suppressed. The, the sacred feminine is the capacity to love and nurture and protect and care for life. There's also the sacred masculine as well, which is also damaged. And uh, the, the, the sacred famine uh, masculine is especially about protecting life. So, but these two uh, work together and in our society with animal agriculture, they're repressed and the sacred feminine is especially repressed. And so we have a situation now where uh, in many ways, uh, the, the feminine has been so repressed that corporations, financial institutions and governmental agencies are able to do things that harm, directly harm our children, harm our environment, harm the community. And we allow it. We just allow it because the sacred feminine has been suppressed. The sacred feminine would rise up like, like the mama bear, as, as we hear, to protect life, to protect the community, to protect the, her children. And that's the, the natural wisdom that we have, but that is suppressed when we force little kids to eat 
meat, dairy, and eggs, like I was forced as a little kid, that suppresses the natural compassion that we have. And so I was able to, as a young teenager, uh, to go away in the summers to a summer camp in Vermont where I, I would kill. I'd hold, have my ax in one hand and the chicken in the other hand. I'd cut the chicken's head off. And, and we were taught to do that. And I didn't have a problem with it because I'd gone through 13 years. At that point, I was about 13 years old. I did that for a few years, 13, 14, 15 um, of the most intense indoctrination a human being can go through. And I knew the whole story, right? I knew the cultural narrative that these animals are put here by God for us to eat. They don't have a soul. They taste good. If you don't eat them, you're going to die within 24 hours of a protein deficiency. So this is just what we have to do. So that wounding I had gone through that allowed me to just hold this chicken like a thing and cut her head off like a thing and then bleed her out and put her through the scalding tank and then eat her. Eat her. And then it was an it. Then it was just the, the breast and the thigh. It wasn't a being anymore. And we did the same thing to the dairy cows. We would put a gun to the head of the dairy cow every um, summer and shoot her in the head and kill her and cut her up, reduce her from a being to a thing. So that is that violent, that gross violence uh, is it, it, essentially it's in our science. It's in every institution in our society. It's in our religions. It's in our educational system. It's how we look at the world. We, we ha we're taught as little kids this, this disenchantment uh, of the universe. Everything is seen as a big machine. There was a big bang, like some kind of, you know, <laughs> You know, the, the old idea, you know, just, we say, that you just give us, you know, one miracle and we can take everything from there. And so we have this big bang for some reason. And then everything after that, it's just a random mutation of genes and uh, just trying to pass on our genetic information. We don't have any purpose, really a deeper purpose. So from my point of view, it's essential to see that all of this is downstream of animal agriculture. Animal agriculture is not merely a way of eating. It's a way of thinking, a way of seeing, a way of being, which is violent towards nature and towards our, or towards spirituality, towards the truth. What is spirituality? Spirituality is nothing exotic. It's merely understanding the truth that what we are is not a thing. What we are is not merely a physical body that was born and will die. What we are is infinite and eternal consciousness that was never born and will never die. When we, we can experience this directly, but we will never experience it unless we make an effort. In our society, it's covered over. And so for some reason, I maybe because I was born in Concord, Massachusetts, and I started reading Thoreau and Emerson, I learned to uh, swim in Walden Pond, and I started getting connected to the transcendentalists, to Walt Whitman, and then to Zen and Buddhism and Tibetan Buddhism, and many other traditions, and actually uh, contemplative Christianity, uh, the Bhagavad Gita, and many different spiritual traditions. I, my the whole 20s, my whole pretty much from the age of 21 to 32 or something, I lived in um, meditation centers. And I just spent thousands of hours just sitting in silence, doing the best I could to quiet my mind <clears throat> and making an effort to just watch my breath and not to do anything in the outer world. I really didn't do very much in the outer world for that, that whole 10 years. I did some things. I, I, I ended up getting eventually later getting a master's degree and a PhD. But, um, but, that, but before that, it was living in these meditation centers and asking, who am I? And going deeper and deeper with that question. But if I'm just this body or just this collection of thoughts or this collection of experiences, this history, this story, but what is that? What, what is the source of that? What is the source of what we are? See, we live in a society where we're not encouraged to ask that question. What is the source? What is the, our true nature? And when we begin to quiet our mind and breathe and connect with our breathing at a deeper level and connect with the being who's breathing and become a witness to what's happening, instead of being an object, running around, trying to change other people, trying to change myself, trying to get something, trying to push something away. Be the being who's just witnessing the whole thing. Eternally, eternally. 
we we take many lifetimes. So we have to, I think, understand that virtually everything we're told in our society is a lie. Literally, virtually everything, because it's based on the lie of animal agriculture. And out of that big lie of being separate from and superior to nature and the created order, everything, uh, all the lies flow from that. It's all lies. It's all misinformation. <laughs> it's all uh, something that's causing us harm. It's absurdities. We're taught absurdities. And Voltaire, I think, was uh, very wise when he said, if we believe absurdities, we will commit atrocities. And this is the big problem is that it's one thing to believe absurdities and if it doesn't harm anybody, okay, you know. But if we believe absurdities, we typically will end up committing atrocities and we, and we can't help it because we don't understand what's going on. We don't understand our true nature. War and disease and injustice flow from believing absurdities that we're separate. See, thinking that I'm just this body, my, my, my gender, my race, and that, that's, that's outer surface stuff. The being that we are, my species, we gotta look beyond all that. And we won't be able to look beyond that unless we make the effort to plumb the depths of our own being. So this is the prerequisite. It has been anyway for me, the prerequisite. I, I went vegetarian right out of college. And then a few years later, I became a vegan back in 1980. I was living in meditation centers at that time. And I think I always say it was the smartest thing I ever did. <laughs> Besides eventually marrying my wonderful wife, Madeline, I was going vegan because that, that really creates the foundation of a possibility to go much deeper spiritually because the mind is then no longer engaging in behavior of paying people to stab and kill animals and drink their, their horribly, horrible, uh, like dairy products and eggs, these horribly abusive uh, products to bring that into this body uh, is, is not a good idea. And it, it, it disturbs us at a very deep level. So the whole idea, I think, essentially is to understand that uh, our underlying wisdom can help us to, to realize our true nature. And when we begin to move to a, a plant-based way of eating, like I did when I was, uh, it was in 1980, so I was 26, I think, something like that, 27. Um, then we have the foundation to go deeper. It doesn't mean we will, though. I mean, I, I've seen it. Unfortunately, many people go vegan and they never really go on a spiritual path. They kind of, for some reason, the woundedness keeps people on sort of the outer materialist surface level, unfortunately. So it's really important, I think, to understand that going vegan is just one small step in a much larger journey, a much grander adventure that we can begin to embrace and that will transform our life in a positive way. So this is, I think, uh, one of the keys uh, to having to health, I mean, to having a healthy life is not only to move to an organic whole food plant-based way of eating and living. Uh, that's a wonderful foundation for health for ourselves, for our environment, for the society. Animal agriculture is a Trojan horse that destroys, I, 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 can, I won't go into it, but it, it, go, it destroys the environment. We all know that, I think, in so many ways. It destroys our society. It creates war. It creates uh, um, loss of justice because we're feeding most of the food we're growing to animals while people go hungry, food shortages, workers stabbing animals. There's so many dimensions of violence to animal agriculture that create a society of violence and disease. All the disease that comes from animal-based foods creates more fear gives tremendous power to the big war machine and to pharmaceutical medical complex, which controls the media. So there's a vast devastating impact of animal agriculture on our society. So we, we can understand that, uh, I think, and begin to realize that and then move in a, in a way uh, towards a meditative way of living and 
question the narrative that's coming from this whole system. So this is the thing that, that I think is, the, is not that easy. I mean, it's kind of easy to go vegan in a sense. I and mean, it's kind of cut and dry, right? I don't eat meat. I don't eat dairy. I don't eat eggs. I don't uh, eat honey. I don't um, buy products tested on animals. I don't go to the rodeo or the circus. I don't wear any wool or silk or leather. You know, so it's kind of this whole thing. It's, it's a lot, but, um, but it's, you can kind of see it. But that's the outer level. What veganism is really, I think, on an inner level is uh, even much more magnificent than, than, than living a life of kindness in the outer world to, to bless animals, to bless human beings and future generations, because it's really about questioning the whole, the whole narrative at the core of our society. And that's when it gets difficult because we begin to realize that a lot of my own thoughts are actually uh, polluted. Uh, unless like our cells get polluted and toxified by eating animal foods, we realize that a lot of our, our attitudes are, are, are harmful in our relationships. And so um, for me, it's been, and I I'm sure for you as well, as you're listening, you know that your health is determined a lot, not only by what you're eating, but also by your attitudes and by the general feeling tone of your consciousness and by the quality of your relationships and by the quality of exercise and movement and by how creative and by the way if you're living a pur your purpose in the world this is this really the spiritual dimension so all these things uh, play into being healthy it's a huge subject and uh, veganism is really about optimizing everything uh, it's about creating a life, I think, of minimalism, for one thing. Minimalism is a wonderful idea. It's an ancient Buddhist idea. You know, like when I was a Zen monk in Korea, you, you didn't get a new robe. <laughs> you had kept repairing the one you had, right? Uh, whatever food you were given, you ate it, right? or you, you could take it too. You could take some, but you never took more than you could eat. You, you, there's nothing to do with it. So you have to eat it. So the whole idea is don't waste anything to just minimize waste. Don't waste water. Don't waste food. Don't waste cloth. Don't waste energy. And I have found that doing the best I can to minimize the amount of violence and the amount of consumption <laughs> um, really is a, a very joyful thing. And we can always do better. I mean, uh, we, you know, we live in the United States, but we live for, for 18 years in, a, in an RV, it's called, and a, you know, a, a, a mobile home. It's about, it was about a 200 square feet. So if I wanted to buy a new pair of pants, I could, but I had to, get, I had to sort of give away a pair of pants. I didn't have room for more than three or four pairs of pants in the RV. So you know, having minimal storage. And we just spent four and a half months actually living in our little tiny a micro van, which is only, I think it's like eight feet by five feet by three and a half feet high. And living in that for four and a half months in a tiny little space and um, realizing that we can be totally happy, <laughs> which is very little without very much. And, uh, and, and then, and then now we have a house, but we, we, um, have a small house and we try to have, spend most of the time uh you know outside i mean quite a bit of time outside in the garden growing food connecting with the earth and nature and living as much as possible in in harmony with the seasons there's so much i want to say actually about being healthy um there's there's many different uh aspects to this the animal agriculture mentality of superiority and entitlement, basically, like we're entitled, uh, we're superior, they're inferior, is this might makes right attitude. And it pervades everything. And so on the media, it's glorified, the people who consume the most, the people who have the most money, they're the ones who have the power, they're the ones we look up to, we want to be like them. So one of the first things I did 50 years ago, 50 years ago, I threw away my, the television. I have, not, I have not watched television in 50 years. I mean, aside from maybe being in the, seeing one somewhere in a, in a uh, somewhere, <laughs> an airport or somewhere. Um, so just disconnecting from the mainstream media. And then I realized 
the radio too, the NPR. I mean, it's just pure lies. So just getting, uh, letting go of, of the mainstream media uh, is, is a tremendous, uh, wonderful way to be healthy. If we want to be healthy, to disconnect from the mainstream media and um, begin to get our news from our intuition, begin to connect with our inner wisdom. And that will guide us to sources of information that are perhaps more uh, reliable than the mainstream. We can get, I can guarantee if it's in the mainstream media, there's an agenda. I know this in my bones because I was raised in the media. You know, it's interesting. My father, uh, when he was a young man, wanted to be a doctor. And he told me that he, um, he wanted to be a doctor. So he was in the army in World War II and he was serving in France and he was a medic. And he said, um, he always said to us, uh, I was the oldest child and my brother and my sister, he always encouraged us to just stay away from doctors. He said, I, I wanted to be a doctor, but I don't think it does. I don't, I, you know, just stay away from them if you can. And uh, he, he saw, you know, a lot of terrible things, of course, in the war as a medic. He also had to give a lot of injections. He said, oh, they'd be lined up here. I had to give them shots, you know, one after the other, hundreds of them. He said, I, I don't think it was good for people. So I was very fortunate to have very few injections <laughs> as a kid. And, uh, and then just grow up in a very free environment. I mean, there was, it's kind of unimaginable. I mean, we, when I think of how we grew up, we never locked the front door of the house. We, I mean, we went away for two weeks on vacation. We left the door open. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't like it was, and, and I could go wherever I wanted. I would walk a mile or two into town or wherever. It was just this freedom as a kid. It was, it was like a, where I grew up in, in Concord, Massachusetts. There wasn't this fear. We spent a lot of time in nature. And uh, so, so there was this basic sense of, of harmony with nature in many ways, although we were eating animal foods, uh, which poisons the whole well. But, um, but he did, in, instead of becoming a doctor, he, became, he owned, bought a newspaper. So when I was a kid, uh, he had the special uh, edition of the newspaper, which was entitled The Heir to the Beacon is Born. That was me. I was the heir to this newspaper called The Beacon. And, um, you know, I learned that the, the newspapers and the media, it's all about connecting with the community, but you have to run you you have to run news articles that the advertisers will never object to. That's kind of part of the, the territory. That's the dilemma. And it's just how it is. You can't run articles that the that the advertisers will pull will, will pull their ads because then you'll go out of business. So so he was very successful. And by the time I was in college, he had about thirteen newspapers, a whole chain of newspapers. But um, I knew in my bones, and I still know it today. You can't trust the media because you're getting the message of the advertisers. And who are the biggest advertisers? Who are putting billions and billions of dollars supporting the media? through advertising, it's the fast food companies, it's the pharmaceutical companies, it's the petroleum companies and the, and the chemical companies and the banks. And so this, uh, this whole way of getting news, so-called news or information is absolutely toxic. Uh, I understand that, but I realized most people didn't have that background and don't, don't see it, I guess, so, so clearly. So I would never watch it. I would never dream of getting information from the media, from newspapers. And I, I see it, the New York Times or the BBC or any of this, it's, it's unreliable. And then of course it's all been taken over even more, not only by the media, but by the CIA and, and other organizations that have an agenda. So it's very important for us to connect with our, um, our intuition and let that guide us to how we get our information and not to, buy into the fear that uh, is being pumped out all the time. Because to be healthy physically, uh, we really a lot of our physical health is dependent on our attitude and on our mind. And our mind will create unconsciously all kinds of hormones, uh, also uh, stress and nervous tension and so forth. And so, uh, 
a big part of being healthy is, is understanding not only nutrition, but understanding our mind and our feelings and how our relationships and our way of being and our, whether we're living our purpose and being creative, how that all works together. And so I think, you know, I'm giving another talk on Wednesday. And I think at that point, I'll, I'll be able to go more in depth into some of the actual practical things we can do to create a really vibrant, healthy life. But it revolves around this holistic view, like super, super holistic, super califragilistic holistic <laughs> uh, view, where we, we understand that we're a being, we're not a thing. And um, I have stayed out of the medical establishment pretty much completely for uh, since 1972. So that's about 50 years also. <clears throat> and um, I went, I did have, uh, when I was a kid, I was riding my bike and I hit a telephone pole uh, and I ruptured my spleen. So I did have um, a splenectomy done when I was, I think, I don't know, 12 years old or, or 10 or something like that. And um, so I haven't, I've had no spleen this whole time. I met a doctor somewhere a few years ago and he said, you don't have a spleen. You have to be taking such and such a drug. And I, I've never taken it. And I, I told him, don't worry, I'm okay. <laughs> but um, so I, you know, I'm not, I'm not anti uh, the medical establishment. I know there's a place where, you know, there's some good things that certainly can be done. But the point I'm making is the more that we as individuals take responsibility for our health, the better it is for us and the better it is for our loved ones and the better it is for everyone. Because this, the more I give away my power to outside forces, the more those outside forces will take that power away. And that's what's happening a lot in our world today. We can see it, it's pretty obvious. So to, you uh, know, to, to practically live this, it means really being mindful being conscious, you know, taking time every day to do what's important. You know, I remember there's this uh, old saying, it's kind of like, a, uh, actually, it's more like a story. Uh, if you have a, a, like a large container, like a tube or something, you want to fill it up with, um, with rocks and uh, uh, large rocks and small rocks and sand, it's not going to work if you put the small rocks and the sand in and then try to get the rocks in, the big rocks in, right? You have to put the big rocks in first, and then you can add the small rocks, and then you can add the sand. That'll all kind of fill in in between the big rocks. So the same thing with our life. Make sure we get the big rocks, the most important things in every day. And for me, that's meditation, that's exercise. So I, I do that first thing in the morning because I get it in. And, and I think it's important to to under, to to understand what are the big rocks, what are the most important things in your life that you want to make sure they happen and to lay the foundation, to create a foundation for a happy, joyful life. And it has to do with, I think, mental hygiene, right? I mean, actually connecting with our consciousness in silence, watching our breathing, watching our consciousness, becoming a witness, being present, just, just, I sit for an hour every morning and just enjoy just being present and without trying to change anything or be anyone, just being aware and getting in touch with the fact that there's at the very core of my being, there's a bubbling spring of joy. And that's true of all of us. It's covered over. We work very hard to keep it covered over with all of our worries about what I should have done and regrets of what I wish I would have done. I wish they would have done and what I'm going to do, getting always involved in the past and the future. If we can enter into the present moment and live our life from the present moment, the present moment is the only place where there's any life. This is it right now, this moment. And the more we live from this moment, without fear. There's nothing to fear in this moment. This moment is it. We can see a danger on the horizon and we can act to respond appropriately, but we don't have to be afraid, right? It's fear. Fear and anger are two things that just attack our health. They suppress our immune system. They make us vulnerable and weaken us. And when we take time to connect with the un fundamental, un, un deniable truth that what we are essentially is incorporeal 
what we are essentially is incorporeal. We do not, we are not embodied. We, we, we have a vehicle, right? I'm waving at you. <laughs> you can't see me, right? I mean, you see, you see something waving. We don't see, we see, we see the effect. It's like if we see a, a footprint in the sand, we don't go up to the footprint and say, George, you know, how are you doing? We know that footprint is made by a being. It's not the being, right? So this is a footprint waving. Right? We have to understand that, that we, we are the beings. Cows and pigs and chickens are also beings. Dogs and cats, I mean, all beings are beings. And once we understand that about ourselves, we'll begin to see that in others, and then we'll naturally have compassion. Then we'll naturally, I think, move toward a vegan way of living because we, we don't want to harm other aspects of ourself. There's one life living through all of us. And so this whole idea of war and competition are a joke. I mean, they're like, like one finger fighting with another one. When, when I'm trying to play the piano, they, that's not going to work, right? We're, we're all uh, here to work in harmony with each other. And so this, the, this understanding and, and taking time to actually um, ground it in, in our daily consciousness in, for the last, I'd uh, say, 45 years has never been a day. I haven't spent at least an hour <clears throat> or at least 45 minutes uh, in meditation. Some days it's been many hours. And I, so, so that's, that, I think, is a big rock. That's something to just put in there and make sure it happens. And there's many other aspects, you know, things we can add to it, to that list. But there's, you know, I think it's important for each one of us to connect with what it is that we feel is important for the foundation of our happiness and well-being so that we can actually be a blessing to others in the world and live our purpose. When we, when we talk about health, you know, you've all heard me talk about this before, probably there's five dimensions of health. There's our physical health, the physical body health, environmental health, cultural health, psychological health, and spiritual health. And those five dimensions of health are all interconnected. So uh, the more we help any one of those, the more it helps all five, the more we create a healthier environment. Going vegan does that. Uh, planting trees does that. Minimizing the amount of our consumption does that. Uh, anything we can do to help our environment, uh, ecology, helps our society, right? Our, it helps our physical health, helps our psychological health, health helps our, our spiritual health. Same thing with our uh, spiritual health. The more we help our spiritual health, the more our body feels better, the more our mind is better, the more we naturally uh, help make a healthier society and a healthier world. What is our spiritual health? That's, that's the one that seems the most uh, abstract. That has to do with what the Greeks uh, called telos. Telos is the old uh, Greek word that means purpose. You know, we're not on this earth just to be healthy. Healthy is being healthy is great, but having a healthy vehicle. Okay, now what? What am I here to? <laughs> we're here to, to use the vehicle for something, right? What's the purpose? That's the thing. And see, we live in a society that is in a crisis of purpose. We don't have a purpose. Most people, unfortunately, don't have a, a, a deep, fulfilling purpose that gets them up in the morning. In a, in a way that brings them a, a deep sense of gratitude and joy and, and fosters their creativity and love. But we can cultivate that by taking time to connect with our purpose, find out what that is. And it may change. Uh, every day we can create it again. What is the purpose? What is my purpose? And I think when we, when we have that as a, as a focal point, what is the purpose? And we, we have a sense that we have a, a unique mission, uh, a unique purpose to fulfill in this lifetime. And when our mind is engaged in that, and we know that there's a reason for this day, and I can't wait to see how this day will unfold to help me in uh, making progress towards manifesting and fulfilling the purpose, then every cell in our body is being fed by and is part of a community that's cooperating. See, this is very important to understand that our body is a community that is cooperating. We have a whole communities of bacteria in, in us, communities of viruses, so-called viruses, uh, millions, billions, trillions, quadrillions <laughs> of these beings inside uh, and, and, and actually helping 
all of the cells that make up the physical body. So there's a, our body is a community. This is well understood. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're all aware of this. Our, our bo physical body is a community of, of trillions of beings and they're, they can be working together in harmony and creating radiant health. So we get up in the morning and we have energy and we move and we have vibrant uh, activity and we have peaceful uh, rest and so forth. All is very sustainable. But the whole idea is purpose is the key to all of that. The sense of, of, um, of being on a mission. And I think uh, one of the, for, my, for me, one of the main points is spiritual awakening. This is something that is uh, exciting and quite on, at a very deep level, I think, uh, motivating that, that, that it is actually possible. I remember reading Thoreau when he wrote, when he was at Walden in his journal and in his book, uh, Walden, he wrote, I'm paraphrasing here, but something like, um, I know of nothing that is more important and more up uplifting than th the idea that by my own effort, uh, I can realize and better myself. Now, this basic idea that by our own efforts, we can uplift and better ourselves. We, uh, we can always heal whatever we went through, whatever trauma, whatever violence, whatever wounds we received earlier in our life, whatever delusion we're suffering under, we can awaken out of that. We can heal those wounds. We are magnificent beings with tremendous capacities. And we uh, don't give ourselves enough credit because the thing is, is we're bombarded with these messages that if we have any kind of problem, go to the drugstore. <laughs> you have a headache, go there. If you have a stomach ache, go there, get, a, get something, get some outer thing or go for counseling or, you know, whatever. Uh, not to say that these things maybe don't help sometimes, but we have within us tremendous capacities for healing. And the more we activate them, the more we get of them. So it's a, it's a cell, it's a virtuous circle. The more we put our faith in just connecting with our breathing, connecting with our, with the truth that we are an infinite spiritual being, our, we are consciousness. We're not just a physical body. That awareness itself, when we hold that for ourselves or when we hold that for another person, that helps heal them too. This is the awareness that uh, of spiritual reality, that consciousness determines matter, not the other way around. We're raised in a society of materialism where we're taught from the time we're little kids that matter gives rise to consciousness, right? That somehow matter just randomly uh, fooling around, banging into each other, created uh, more complex proteins, amino acids that ran into each other and created simple cells and then created simple and then all the way up to human beings. I mean, you can't imagine a more absurd, ridiculous, stupid thing to teach people, to teach children than such a nonsense. But that's that. And, but if you want to be able to dominate and exploit people and steal their purpose, that's the kind of myth you tell, right? You tell a myth that strips away all meaning from people's lives. It strips away the, the power that what we are was never born and will never die, that what we are creates our reality through our perception and that we can transform our life and transform the world around us by transforming ourselves. That's actually much more in alignment with the truth of being, which we can discover within ourselves. We can quiet our mind enough. I mean, I've experienced this myself in long meditation retreats where I was able to leave my physical body, right? I could see my body. So I, this, is not, this is not anything to be proud of. It's just basically, look, you know, we are consciousness. We're in a body. We're not this body. So once we understand that, what does it matter what this body looks like or what race it is? Or, I mean, all of these things are, um, are, are just delusions to separate us. Once we understand that we create, we're actually creating the health of our body with our consciousness. So then we can begin to work with things. And I've, I've told stories about these things. Like I'll just tell this one brief story. When I had a, I was on a long retreat and I had a pain in my lower back and I remember working with it 
oh, and, and trying to get it to go away and it wouldn't go away. <laughs> and I woke up the next morning and it was still there. And I started writing in my journal and I, I got this in meditation, this, this very clear message, like someone just spoken in my ear, a pain in the body is a pain in the mind. And so I started meditating on that idea. A pain in the body is a pain in the mind. What does that mean? And so I was all by myself in the middle of the woods in Oregon. And I hadn't seen anyone in like two months. I was just alone in a meditation retreat. And I get into kind of a, a whole expanded state of consciousness. And I began to see what it was. And, and I had had a problem with chronic back pain. And I began to see that there was a little boy, a little will little billy you know when he was four five six seven eight years old he was very outgoing and happy but then at a certain point he started getting afraid and started wanting to make an impression on people and he started to put a wall up i, I at one point i had to start wearing glasses uh because i couldn't i started getting a blur i couldn't see the world uh, i've given up my glasses all that stuff but at that point i you know i i had a blur and i could see that there was a little boy that was wounded and that pain was in the pain of in my back was manifesting. I, it hurt to reach out. It hurt to bend forward. It hurt to, you know, if I wanted to pick up a water bottle from the floor, ouch, it hurt so much. <laughs> so I, as I began to meditate on that, I began to see that the pain in my body was actually uh, a, 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 a benevolent um, sign from the universe to help me heal this inner emotional wound. And so I began to work with it and I worked with it. I'm, I'm, you know, I think I'm still working with it, but I, I, got a, I had a breakthrough on that retreat where I, I got it. I could see this little boy and I started loving this little boy. And I said, you know, I understand you had that, that whole thing happen, but that's not who I am <laughs> anymore. And when I really got that at a deep level, I knew it was healed and I got up and there was no pain. The pain was gone for the whole, for years. It's been gone. So, um, so we can we can work with uh, out like pains in our body or, or symptoms in our body to help us understand ourselves more. If I had instead of that, I had said, "Oh man, I can't stand this pain. I'm just going to break my retreat. I'm going to go to the drugstore. I'm going to go to the doctor. I'm going to get. I'm going to have a procedure done, or I'm going to have a uh, get a drug to take away my pain." All right, so you never dealt with, I never dealt with the little boy. I never dealt with the pain. I never dealt with that whole thing. So it still wants to be healed because we're spiritual beings on a journey of awakening. So if we don't heal, <laughs> it's going to come back some other way. And it usually it goes deeper and then it comes out as something even more severe. And then of course, the medical pharmaceutical industry is right there to give us, to make more money, right? And to use that money to buy more ads and to make us even more brainwashed that we have to go to them for the answer to all of our problems. No, the problems come uh, from within and they're solved from within, essentially. Uh, I think this, is, this approach uh, puts us back into the, our true seat, the true seat of our true self, where we realize that what we are it never came and never left. It's just, we're here, we're, we're the sky. The clouds are coming, the clouds are going, I can see them coming and going, and they're big and they're dark. They cannot ever harm the sky of our eternal consciousness. That's the thing to remember. And when we hold that space for ourselves and hold that space for others, we can be a space of healing. And then out of that comes vegan living, right? Vegan living is compassion for all living beings. It's radical inclusiveness. It's including all living beings in the sphere of our compassion and concern. So I'm not going to take out my wallet and pay for non-organic foods. I'm not going to pay some farmer to spray uh, glyphosate all over his fields or in his orchard and kill and destroy the microbiome of the soil and then eat that. And it's going to destroy the, the microbiome, which is the community of bacteria in my gut, it's the same thing. You know, these, these toxic chemicals make a lot of money for the chemical pharmaceutical complex. That's one complex, by the way, Pet petro petroleum, the petrochemical pharmaceutical, it's one industry. It's a petroleum industry, basically. It makes huge money on people not understanding these things. And, and so when we don't understand these things, we, 
take toxins in and we toxify our body. And so I'm not going to pay for someone to toxify the soil and kill uh, the fungus that is so important, the mycelium, to create the community that creates healthy soil, that creates healthy plants. No, no, no. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to grow my own food, right? So we have a garden here. We've planted about 70 fruit and nut trees and lots of herbs and vegetables and berries. And Madeline's out there every day harvesting. And we're harvesting um, greens. And, and uh, it's only April. So we're, you know, we're still, uh, we'll be getting a lot more in, in a few months. But the basic idea is um, to support people who are working in harmony with nature, who are building the soil, who are doing organic or veganic, like we do, veganic agriculture, where we don't use bone meal and blood meal and manure. We use um, compost tea and compost and wood chips and so forth and build up the soil and create healthy soil and create healthy community. So the whole idea here is to look uh, deeply and see our interconnection with nature and with life around us and realize that uh, our health comes from within. And when we live that way, then we adopt naturally a vegan way of living that's organic, that's whole food. I'm not gonna buy foods out of a factory. I mean, when we get sensitive to energy, the whole idea really with health is about vibration. And if we are vibrating at a relatively low level with lots of fear and anger and frustration, then we're going to be sucking into us low level foods, you know, vibrations, relationships, alcohol, probably <laughs> drugs of various kinds, toxic media. We're going to be attracted to all that stuff. When we raise our vibration and we just vibrate at the level of joy and freedom and beauty, and we take responsibility for that, we don't let ourselves be a victim. Do, do it. We can do it. It, it, it just this present moment right now is the only reality so do it right now and we do it every moment moment to moment we have to it, it's a it's it's practice i think that's the thing you know i was raised playing the piano practicing my father played the piano i wanted to be like him so i was practicing every day i was learning religion and spirituality is about practice veganism is about practice everything is about practice we just do the best we can to practice what it is we would like to improve on. And don't think we're ever going to get there. Just keep practicing and don't, don't be proud about anything. Just practice, do the best we can. So if we practice health, right? It's a practice, then it's, it's a holistic practice of looking at how we're seeing. I mean, I, I'm going to, maybe on Wednesday, I'll talk about how to have healthy eyes, how to have healthy teeth, how to have healthy breathing, how to have healthy thoughts, and so forth. I mean, there's, there's so much to it. But, oh, time is, oh my gosh, it's almost time to stop. Um, but the whole idea is to understand that when we are connected at a deeper level, then veganism uh, becomes a healthy way of doing veganism, not with, not with factory farm foods, um, not with, well, I mean, uh, you know, factory foods, factory produced foods or non-organic foods, but with uh, a vibrational level and foods that are, are clean. So we love uh, clean living foods, getting connected to that. And, um, and then, and then not only what we're eating, but how we're eating it, eating it with a sense of gratitude and joy. So it's, it's how we're living our lives that is so important in this whole thing. And realizing that we're living in a society where, in a sense, we're being bombarded with everything I'm saying, the opposite of that. We're being bombarded with messages that are trying to lower our vibration, war and fear, and they're the enemy, we hate them. All of these kinds of things because there's no money in healthy people, right? I mean, I have not given any money <laughs> in 50 years. Uh, I mean, very little, well, I've given a few dollars here and there to, for Band-Aids and things, but basically to the pharmaceutical industry, to drug stores, to doctors, I've never had health insurance in like 50 years. So I think, you know, it's just, um, it just behooves us to realize that if we're healthy, it's not going along with the narrative. So we're definitely going to be um, like, like as vegans, right? We're, as vegans in general, we know what it's like 
um, to say no, right? I say, no, I'm, I don't go along with the narrative of stealing the sovereignty of individuals, right? And individual cows, pigs, and chickens, and turkeys, or human beings, right? We, we stand up for and we support the sovereignty of all living beings. And we allow all living beings to celebrate their lives, including human beings. And we don't support media or government agencies or uh, food companies or media, I mean, or any, anything that, that takes away or harms the sovereignty of animals of nature and of human beings. And um, this is a tremendous foundation for health. We'll, we'll, we'll naturally be creating healthy food. If we, we can be eating what we think is a totally healthy diet, what they say is healthy. But if we haven't transformed our consciousness and our attitudes, then we'll, our physical body is going to manifest symptoms. The way it is now, um, our physical body manifests symptoms as a, as a as a as part of a cleansing process right we're cleansing all the time because there's chemicals there's, there's over 10 i don't know close to 100,000 i think it's like 90 to 100,000 toxic chemicals that the chemical industries create that go into the air and the water and the soil and the food and everywhere and so our bodies now have a much harder job of cleansing all these toxins so that will appear as a cough or as diarrhea, or as uh, a skin uh, condition of some kind, or as a runny nose, or a sore throat, or as a headache. And so the whole idea, from my point of view, is when that happens, I don't see that as a bad thing. I see that, okay, my body's cleansing. I just go with it. it takes about, at the most, a few hours or a day, and it's done. So, um, so this kind of cleansing, it, it, you know, when we're eating a healthy diet and have some of these attitudes I'm talking about, uh, we don't need to cleanse that much, but there's a lot, there's actually a lot more to it. Um, I'm running out of time here. So I think what I'll do is um, I'll plan on following up on some of these more practical things that we can do uh, on Wednesday morning. I'm giving a talk on Wednesday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern time, 6 a.m. here <laughs> in California. Um, so. I think uh, I should probably stop. It looks like it's about 1130. So let me know if, um, if it's a good time to take questions. I think uh, I, that's the agreement that we have here. So Will, thank you. Here. I, yeah. Um, pardon the interruption. And, and, and listen, we're happy to take questions. But if you have more to share, we'd love to have you share more. It's really entirely up to you. We definitely our next lecture starts in about a half hour. So your call. Well, just tell me if there's anything that anybody has said in this. I'm not reading the chat. I'm too busy talking. But if there's anything in the chat or if anyone wants to raise their hand, I'd love to talk about what people are interested in. You know, I can talk about what I'm interested in all day, but I'd love to hear what the other people are interested in. If I can shed any light or whatever on that. That, well, that, sound, that, that sounds great. We really appreciate that. So, in fact, yeah, um, we normally, as you know, don't always take questions from the chat. So we do ask people to raise their okay, hand. Good. Uh, and, and for those folks that don't know how to raise their hand, I want to make sure you understand that. All you need to do is uh, go to your Zoom window. You'll see a few different tabs. One of those tabs is called your reactions tab. You click on your reactions tab and there's a raise hand function there that you click on and we'll see your hands raised. And uh, then I'll be able to call you by your first name and I'll unmute you and uh, you'll be able to ask your question of Will Tuttle. Will, before we jump in, um, where can everybody get your book and reach back out to you again directly if they want to? Right. Thanks. Uh, so I'd say uh, our website is willtuttle.com, worldpeacediet.com. And um, uh, the books are available, of course, on the usual places, Amazon and, and uh, audio books are on Audible and uh through our website and so forth and, and barnes and noble i guess different places uh yeah and we're and we have uh, videos uh essays our lecture tour schedule and all kinds of things madeline's intuitive cooking our garden tours we just did a new uh garden tour uh posted that yesterday and if you want to see what a nine-year-old food forest looks like in northern california <laughs> you can go on our garden tour it's a, it's a lot of fun, but yeah, we are happy to, to answer people's questions. If they want to send me an email through the website, that works fine. And I'd like to stay in touch with people for sure. Thank that's, you. That's beautiful. Thank you. By the way, are those Madeline's uh, pieces Madeline's of paintings in the background? Yeah. yeah. She's amazing. She's amazing. Yeah. 
Right. Thank you. Okay, so from there, let's uh, let's jump right in. We've got a few hands raised already, and so I'm going to go now to Alejandro. Uh, welcome, Alejandro. Hi. Uh, well, uh, thank you so much for that great presentation. I really love how you articulate different different points about health and how you kind of connect the dots and have that holistic uh, holistic approach right there with you. And so. Are you familiar with the, um, are you familiar with a show called Wis Wisdom Teachings on the Gaia platform? I'm not, I'm, I've heard of it a little bit, but I haven't really um, gone there. Okay. Um, he, yeah. That show is, is it's by David, it, the host is, his name's David Wilcock. You might've heard of him. He talks about a lot of the subjects that you talked about but he goes even deeper and then he also has all the scientific backing with it and then so my question for you is so he talks about how the earth like rocks and trees and metals those are all in what he calls first density and then second density would be like animals and third density would be humans and I'm, I've been vegan now for a couple of years and I, it kind of caught me because I, I, I said, okay, well, he said that animals don't become third density like humans until they're aware of themselves. So I just wanted to know your perspective on that because I, for one, I, I recognize animals as sentient beings and they do feel pain. They do, you know, uh, see, hear, touch, smell, all that have. So what's your perspective on that? Thank you, Alejandro. That's a great question, actually. It's a very deep one. And um, there's different uh, schools of thought about that. Uh, you know, I've been a vegan for 42 years now, and I um, always did it from the very beginning, mainly out of uh, compassion for animals. I, I, I saw their suffering. Somebody told me about it, and also f the starvation of humans. And so uh, through 42 years of being vegan, I've gotten more and more sensitized to um, the cultural narrative that we human beings are inherently superior to, to animals. And, and more and more, I question it uh, because I think it's, it's used as a way to justify and rationalize imprisoning them, stealing their purposes, seeing them as less than us and so forth. Um, I, I mean, it's obvious uh, to me that animals have tremendous intelligence and capacities of the, in the ways that they live their lives. I mean, I just love watching squirrels <laughs> or watching birds or, you know, I mean, how they are with each other, how, how the pelicans in Florida, I mean, we lived all over the country and I've traveled all over the world a lot. And I mean, animals are, have an exquisite intelligence. And um, there's a lot of, of course, science is always refers to consciousness as a black box. We don't know anything about it, but they have done quite a few experiments to show that uh, quite a few different uh, animals uh, do seem to be self-aware, like they, they recognize themselves in a mirror and so forth. And so it seems like everything that we've said historically that... Um, uh, is unique to humans. Sooner or later, we find that animals also have that. And so I, I think, obviously, we are unique, but every animal is unique. And, and instead of having this sort of hierarchical view uh, that uh, some are more evolved or better or, or whatever than others, to see them all as as equally beautiful manifestations of, of the creative, infinite creative spirit, however you want to uh, conceive of that as God or, or the creator. And God loves all of us, right? I think, I do think all beings, but I do think, and, and so our job is to love and appreciate all of them. And I think since we're living in a culture that's organized around animal agriculture and we're born into that, it's very difficult for us to actually peel away the scales from our eyes and see clearly what animals really are. I think at some point, if we actually create or co-create a, a society that's totally vegan and, and spiritually evolved, then we will be at that point in a position to perhaps engage with animals in a way that we may understand them a lot better. 
because we won't be, they won't be afraid of us. I mean, we won't be in a, we'll, we'll, it'll be a whole different thing. And we'll be able to communicate with them tele telepathically more in, in other ways. And I think when that begins to happen, we, you know, we may, doors will open and we may understand them uh, in a deeper way than we can possibly do right now. Um, there's different traditions. Uh, I, I know this, like Rudolf Steiner talks about, uh, and the Jains uh, also talk about the, the, how many senses, you know, like that there's just humans and then there's animals and then there's plants and then there's uh, minerals and so forth, this sort of hierarchical kind of a, a view. But um, these systems always say that it's essential to have compassion for all beings and be care caring of all beings. In the Buddhist tradition, just to, to kind of throw that out there is another perspective. Um, there's the idea of the six realms. Uh, the six realms, so basically we incarnate until we're enlightened, we incarnate in one of the six realms. And the human realm is, is one of the three upper realms, is the human realm, the um, Asura realm, which is the Titans, and then the Deva realm, which is the gods. They, you know, they're in bliss all the time. The Titans are always these powerful competing gods. And then there's humans. And then there's the three lower realms, which are the, the lowest is the hell realms, which is a lot of suffering. Uh, the hungry ghost realms, which is a lot of suffering out of greed. Um, the hell realms usually out of violence. And then the, the animal realm is one of the third is the other realm. So these are the six realms. And the idea is that our, we are, we are consciousness. And depending on how we live our life, we'll be reborn in one of those six. You know, so if we, if we really are very loving and kind, we'll be reborn in a Deva realm. But they're all temporary. They last a, a certain amount of time, and then we're reborn from there into another realm. So, so that's called the samsara, the cycle of rebirth. So animals is, is one of the lower realms because it's considered more difficult to attain enlightenment uh, because you can't, it's hard to really comprehend the teachings the way you can as a human being. But but, a hum but, but, but there are beings just like, I mean, you know, so there's many stories of people then dying and then being reborn as a fish or as a chicken or as a cow or whatever, a dog, and dogs being born as humans or as Davids. I mean, it's like you're, we're going through these six realms, uh, you know, forever, right? Millions and millions and millions of times until we get out of it, until we waken out of that whole, the six realms. And we get into and we understand that we are the source of everything. So the whole idea here is these are models, right? I, you know, I'm not going to say what's if they're true or not, but but they're ways of trying to understand our relationship with other beings. And there's many, most all traditions of the world recognize local deities. I mean, I when I was living in Tibetan Buddhist centers, you know, we were always making uh, off, food offerings to the local deities. And we live in a society where there's no, no there's no local deities here. <laughs> we have this materialistic view that we're just, everything is matter, right? We, and, and there's no other, no other beings. If you can't see them, they don't exist. You know, this is, this is the most violent, warlike, almost suicidal culture in the history of the world. And we don't see anything other than matter. I mean, we've, we're so lost. But I think, the, the, you know, to, to see that there's, there's a tremendous... Uh, kaleidoscopic celebration of consciousness on this planet. And for us to try to, in a reductionistic way, say that animals are less or on this level and we're on that level and other, and even to say six realms, I think there's probably personally, they, they have a word in Buddhism called the Kili, the word is kiliocosm, which means an infinite number of universes. And so the, 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 the vast expanse of consciousness creating reality uh, is, is infinite. And it's good to have a big picture. Like right now, what's happening on this planet, it seems like a big deal, but to, to step back and see, and, and maybe we'll be born as, a, as an animal, and then maybe we'll be born as something else. But what is this we? Who is it that keeps getting born? What is that? That's what we should be trying to find out. Because the being, it, the being is not confined by the body. So the whole idea is to understand that at a deeper level. And that's the, that's the adventure to actually awaken that. And no one can do that for someone else. So I would have to say that I probably don't agree with David Wilcock on this, this kind of uh, way of, of sort of putting things, but, but I don't, but I, you know, if that's what, if that works for him, you know, the thing is you have to be careful because it can be used as a way 
as a, and as a rationality for dominating and exploiting or seeing ourselves as superior. And that's a big trap that, uh, that we all, we live in a society that's based on that delusion and that absurdity that then we commit atrocities, right? It's a small step. Once we believe something that's not true, that then to do harmful things that then come back to us because it, whatever we do, it always boomerangs. So if we harm others and make them sick, we get sick. If we force medicate him, we get forced medicated. Whatever we do to others comes back to us. So that's important to remember that. But that's a great question. Thanks. Thanks very much, Will. Uh, up next, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to bring in Mike. Hi, Mike. Uh, good afternoon. Hi, Will. Uh, very nice talk. I follow a lot of what you're saying there. And I want to get your perspective on a scenario that was de depicted in a movie called Jupiter Ascending. It was a, basically a movie where off-world commerce people harvested the earth because it kind of fits if you look at it from the vein of if there's, you know, if you look at the earth as a plantation, for instance, and you have a plantation owner, the plantation owner is going to want to maximize the capital or the chattel that is within his plantation. And one of the best ways to do that is to use media and other mechanisms to increase dopamine and suppress serotonin so that they're looking more for pleasure, you know, immediate pleasure, constant refreshing that pleasure to be able to drive them to do the behaviors that you want. Similar to Plato's cave, where if you've never known anything other than what you've seen, you're going to fear the unknown. Right. Well, I haven't seen that. Uh, is that, is that it? Is that your question? Um, uh, uh, Mike, hang on. Okay. Uh, are you there? Hang on a second. Something happened to his mic. One, two, three. Can... Oh, you're back. Okay, that was okay. weird. You kinda... yeah, is, is that it? Or you... Well, I mean, the... I just want to get perspective on that overall. Okay. I, I hope I articulated it well enough to understand okay. what I'm asking. Yeah, well, it... <laughs> I mean, I don't know uh, what to make of... I, hadn't, I haven't seen that movie and, and whether... Um, there are extraterrestrials who, who are actually farming human beings uh, right now. <clears throat> I mean, I, mean I, I can see that metaphorically or perhaps even actually that that is actually what is happening. It's, um, it's possible. Uh, Aldous Huxley in, his, in Brave New World um, talked about this idea that, you know, we can create a, a, a sort of ideal society by just dumbing people down in a certain way. So they just, all they want is to fulfill their basic pleasures and we steal their purposes and we use them and slave them and they don't, and they enjoy it. They like it. And uh, you'll own nothing. You'll be happy. You know, that idea. And I think, um, uh, it's, it, you know, there's, it's something to be aware. Just, just, I guess it's just something to, to be aware of that um, if we want to um, be free, truly free, uh, then we have to question everything. And uh, like, you were, like this movie and like you're saying, there, there's a chance that the media is used uh, to create us to, you know, to create a narrative and to create us to think in a certain way that uh, is in alignment with what, how they want us to act so that we're just doing what they want, right? And so... Um, it's a it's a type of slavery that's not so obvious and um it could be i mean i think there's in many ways when i look out into the world because in a way i left the world when i went on my spiritual pilgrimage right after college and in a way i feel like i never came back i just see um a slave a slave society in many ways uh it, it, the slavery is sort of hidden under the surface but it springs up all the time very easily. People will just do whatever they're told, even if it's not in their best interest. They'll eat foods that kill them. They'll do things that make them sick. They won't question obvious things. They'll let their money be taken away from them. They'll let everything, be, they'll let their children be taken away from them. I mean, it's like, like a slavery uh, society in many ways and much more than I think people realize. And, uh, we are viewed, I mean, the same way we view livestock, like we view them as just chattel property. I think you could, it's pretty obvious that there's a, a wealthy elite uh, on this uh, planet that views humanity the same way. 
And, and um, so how do we respond to that? You know, that's the question. How do we as individuals respond to that situation? And what's the, what's the way of living that maximizes our health and the, and the possibility that we can create a healthy society? How do we create kind of a parallel um, society that's free? I think that's what the real truth about health consciousness about health is all about. It's uh, creating an alternative set of narratives based on freedom and not going along with the official narratives that cause suffering through EMF fields, through GMOs, through animal agriculture, through pharmaceutical drugs and medications, all these things that are being rolled out that enslave humanity, essentially. Uh, how do we maintain our, our health and sanity and create vibrant societies or, or parallel, kind of like a parallel society uh, group of people who are conscious and aware and filled with love and joy and, and happiness. Uh, and so that our vibration stays at the level where we're not, we don't support slavery. Uh, that's really, I think, what your question's pointing at. And, and, and uh, it's a very, uh, again, it's an intriguing question. Thanks. Well, it's it, it, it very, and much like you said, knowledge will set you free. And that's what a lot of this, this true conference gives us is, is knowledge that you don't read or see or hear about in other places. So it's very valuable. And again, Steve and Ben, thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. Um, now let's go ahead to Lorraine. Uh... Hello there. Can you hear me? Hi. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, at the age of 81, my life is being transformed by these lectures. Yours being the one that's touched my heart the most. Um, I have been a Buddhist for many years, but I don't like to meditate. I don't want to do it. I'm a product of our society. Uh, I have been vegan now for four months and most of my anger is gone, hooray, hooray. But, you know, sitting there quietly meditating is not something that's feeding my dopamine, in my opinion. And I am addicted to dopamine. You know, four months of plant-based hasn't changed me completely after a lifetime of living a, a less than um, admirable life. I'm not saying I did bad things. I just didn't do great and good things. I want to change. How can I sit there and meditate for even 20 minutes to begin this journey? Right. Well, thanks, Lorraine. That's, uh, it's great to have you. And uh, I admire your flexibility to take up veganism at 81. That's a great thing. That's fantastic. And, um, you know, I think a lot of it, you know, it's, it, it, we make it into um, uh, a struggle. Uh, we feel that we uh, have maybe have better things to do uh, and uh, we don't, we're not comfortable very often with ourselves, with our own mind. So I would say uh, connect with your breathing, you know, as a, as a meditation practice, it's really, we're always breathing anyway. And the breath is something that can be either conscious or unconscious. Usually it's unconscious. Like right now, put your hand on your chest one hand on your chest, put the other hand on your belly and just uh, take an inhale and then exhale. They're not wacky. They're wacky to you. Times. They're not inhale. wacky to me. Uh, pardon me, Will. Just for, Mike, if you can still hear us, we're not able to mute you, but if you can mute yourself, that would be a great help. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Sorry about that. Thanks. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, I'm telling you to do this, Lorraine. Everybody who's watching uh, or listening, just put your one hand on your chest one hand on your belly, down by your belly button, below your belly button, down in your belly, and just notice what moves when you inhale, which hand moves, or if both move or whatever. And so the whole idea is, if you're breathing, if, you're, if your hand that's on your chest is moving, then you're breathing too high <laughs> up. The hand down on your belly is the one that should be going in and out when you breathe. And um, if that's the one that's going in and out, that's great. But to make that more uh, the one that's always moving. So just let your breath go all the way down into your belly, into your lower diaphragm. 
And when you do that and breathe, you'll just naturally breathe more slowly and deeply and just watch yourself breathing slowly and deeply. And you can do uh, a practice where you're watching that. You can do some counting in the beginning. It's usually helpful just to get a sense of it. So like very often it's recommended to count maybe from one to 10 or one to 20 and then you start over again. And if you think, if you lose track, just come back to the number. And then after you get good at that, you can let go of the counting. But the idea is to have your mind tethered to something because the mind is like a, a wild animal, right? It's just running around all over the place. So the idea is in the beginning to just let uh, your mind focus on your breathing. You can, you can count uh, from one to 10 with each inhalation. And just, and don't try to be good at it. Don't try to like make it be, you know, improve or whatever, just do it regularly. Just keep practicing that. And gradually with time, you'll begin to be able to do it. So you can let go of the counting and then just watch the breathing. And as you become a witness of your breathing, you'll become more aware of how your breathing changes when your emotions change. And you'll begin to become more friendly with your own mind. That's really the thing. And, and with um, uh, the, the different uh, changes that are happening all the time in consciousness, the thoughts and how thoughts give rise to different feelings. And you'll begin to get a feeling of what are your own thoughts and what are more thoughts that are coming from all the programming. And you'll begin to get in touch with your inner wisdom, your inner intuition, uh, as the mind gets quieter, then you get you begin to learn to distinguish between those, uh, and that's a, a, you know there's there's many positive things that happen out of this process. It's very simple. It's uh, we we tend to try to make it um, complicated, but it's really very simple. Just be aware of the breathing in the abdomen. Just let it come and go. You can and and there's different practices you can do. You can also watch it right here at the tip of your nose. And just the air as it comes in and goes out. That's another good practice. You can watch it there, but let, let the air go all the way into your, uh, deep into your abdomen. And uh, try to keep this throughout the day. Uh, just aware of that your breath is going deeper into your abdomen. It's, most people, just like we're not taught how to eat properly, we're not taught how to, how to breathe properly in our society. We're just not. The most basic things we're not taught at all. And so most people are breathing uh, very shallow chest breathe, breaths, which tend to keep us anxious, frightened, uh, irritated, and so forth. So if we, if we just naturally uh, begin to take this process uh, to breathe in a slower, deeper way, then we'll find that our mind gets just more relaxed and we're more at peace. And when someone says something that makes us uh, upset, uh, instead of reacting, we can breathe <laughs> and remember, you know, remember that what we are is the consciousness that makes this possible. That's the thing. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long journey in many ways, but the good news is it's just this moment. Every moment is just this moment. So it's a very, uh, in a way, it's a very short journey. It's just right now, if we're conscious right this minute, every moment, um, we, we're planting the seeds of a positive future then. When we do that, when we, when we create a positive present moment, this instant right now, that's planting the seeds for the next moment. And this is something we have power over. We have power over the quality of our own consciousness. I don't have power over society, right? Society is going to do, or other people, what they're going to say, what they're going to do. But I do have the uh, capacity to respond, how I will respond to the whole thing. And we can respond by either getting afraid or tense or just by, by watching. And we have you know, the capacity to increase or develop through practice our skillfulness in this whole thing. It's really about skillfulness. In the Buddhist tradition, um, there isn't so much this idea of good and evil or right and wrong it's more skillful and unskillful <laughs> you know you know so eating animal foods isn't evil or bad it's just unskillful it causes a lot of suffering 
to these animals. It causes a lot of suffering to you. It's going to all, everything we do boomerangs back guaranteed in this life or the next. So the whole idea is live skillfully, do things that bring peace and harmony and love and joy in your relationships with yourself, with others and practice. And one of the greatest practices is becoming aware of our mind. Everything comes from our mind. And uh, there's nothing wrong with, uh, you know, being uh, with dopamine. It's just the idea to, um, to get, get your natural high just by being aware of your breath, not need, needing anything really in the outer world to just feel happy. Hopefully that helps. Thank you so much, Will. Um, we are right up against the clock, but I see, I see one last question. If we could sneak Crystal in real quickly. Crystal, we have just a minute. What's your question for Will? Okay. Um, thank you so much. No question, just a comment. Thank you so much for this presentation today. It's clear that you are a highly evolved individual in your thinking. And if in fact we could get more people to step out of what we've been programmed to believe, we could have a different world. And so it takes one person just like you sharing love, which is at the root of everything that we, if, if we were to allow love to be at the root of everything that we did, we wouldn't be killing animals and we wouldn't have, I wouldn't be a victim of racism or you wouldn't be a victim of something else. Um, so just kudos to you. Keep up the good work. Let's continue to spread this message. There was a book that was released called the four agreements. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, Yeah. Mm -hmm. but yeah, one of, you know, one of the things that he brought out in the book is that when we are born into this world, we're just programmed the, the information from our parents. So just download it into us. And you mentioned, if we don't question anything, we could never, we just can never grow. We just become little right. robots or slaves. And so kudos to you, much love to you. You are an awesome human being. And I pray God's favor and blessing over your life as you go forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Crystal. That's a really a beautiful thing to say. And uh, the same thing I just would wish for everyone. Much love to all of you. Thank you so much. I always say you can never argue with a D minor chord. <laughs> so thanks for your love and for your efforts to help make a more harmonious, healthy world. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I want to second what Crystal said. Um, well said, Crystal. Amen. And, uh, and we're just so grateful that you were here today, that you come back year after year with us. Again, this message is too vital for you not to. And, uh, and we're just very, very grateful uh, that you're here. And I know I'm not the only one that wants to thank you. So we're going to have our tech team unmute our entire audience. What does everybody want to say to Will Tuttle? Thank you, thank you so much.